All right, let's begin. Welcome to CS 2050. Topic of today's is uh, GCD and LCM. You probably have heard about the greatest common divisor and the least common multiple. Have you guys seen this in like elementary school or something? Some basic understandings today. Today we'll put it in a, in a strong number theoretic framework about what these are. GCD, uh, the GCD of A and B is some number D uh, such that D divides into A and uh, D divides into B, and D is the max number to do so. It's a maximal. D is the greatest common divisor. It is a number that is greatest, and it is a divisor. So it's the greatest common divisor of both A and B. Um, what is GCD of, let's see what I have. I have 105 and 30. Fifteen. How did you get that? Three and five. Three and five. Okay. Yeah. Anything bigger? No. The GCD. One way to think of it is actually kind of like a set intersection. So you can think of GCD as uh, you write out each of A and B as a prime factorization, and then you take the set intersection of their factors. So one hundred five. What's the prime factorization of one hundred five? I have, well, seven. I have seven. Okay. So it's three, five, seven. Prime factorization of 30? Two, three, three, five. I chose those as three sequential prime number factorizations. What you do is you take the set intersection of both. Is you, if you write them out as prime factorizations, you say, well, there's a three and a five here, and there's a three and a five here. So the output is going to be three times five, right? Uh, what is the GCD of... Let's say two squared and uh, and two cubed. Yeah, two squared. Two squared is the largest number that divides both into two squared, of course, because it's itself. Two squared also divides into cu two cubed. So if you have a set of prime factors like this, you can think of it as taking the smallest of these two because that's the only one that you need that has to divide into both, right? If you, it's not two cubed. Because 2 cubed um, does not divide into 2 squared, right? Here's a, uh, another one. What about GCD of uh, 2 and 3? One. 1. Two numbers are said to be relatively prime if the GCD of them is 1. In some sense, they are, they are considered prime to each other, right? Uh, Let's suppose we wrote out two numbers and their prime factorization. Instead of a and b, we'll write a. We prove the fundamental theorem of arithmetic that a is written as a product of prime powers. b is written also as a unique product of prime powers. What is, let's suppose we write it out that way. Let's say a is written out as the product of p1, i is equal to 1 to k, of pi to the ai. And b is written as the product of j equals 1 to L of P, uh, pj uh, bj, right? Uh, what should we expect this to be equal to in terms of its, uh, as a product of primes? By the way, are you guys familiar with this giant pi notation? Have you guys seen this before? When you write uh, like uh, the sum of a1 plus a2 plus to ak, Sometimes you can write this as the sum of i is equal to 1 to k of ai, right? This is something you may be familiar with calculus. You take the uh, Riemann sum, right? And then you generalize it. You take the integral, right? The pi is just a product. Sigma is for sum. Pi is for product. P, S, right? Pi just means take the product of those numbers, right? So for example, when we say a is equal to the product of i is equal to 1 to k of pi, of pi to the ai, what we mean is that this is equal to p1 to the a1 times p2 to the a2 times the pk to the ak. That's what we mean, right? So given that we can write a and b as unique prime factorizations of pi to the ai, what should we write 
uh, the GCD of them as a product, if we understand GCD as a set intersection of its factors? Well, first, it's going to be a product of primes. Certainly, everything is a prime factorization. Say i is equal to 1 to something of pi to what? Minimum of ai and bi. The minimum of ai and bi. To what? What, what? what is the largest prime of both, of the GCD? In terms of k and l. The min function min of a, b is equal to a if a is uh, less than equal to b and uh, min of a, b is equal to b if b is less than or equal to a. Right? The min of a, b just returns one of those two. If 2 squared, the GCD of 2 squared and 2 cubed is going to be 2 squared. By fundamental theorem of arithmetic, the GCD is a prime is a product of prime powers, and each power is the minimal of the two prime powers for each number, right? For example, if I did GCD of, I don't know, 2 squared, 3 cubed, 5 to the 1, 7 uh, to, the, to the 10, and I did, let's say, 2 squared, 5 uh, to the 5, and let's say uh, 11 to the 1. Right? The GCD of this is you go term by term and you take the minimum of each of them. You take two, there's a two squared in both of these, right? So it's going to be two squared times, there's no three squared in this one, right? GCD has to divide both A and B, but no th power of three divides into B here. So there's no three on that side. So we skip this one, it's going to be three to the zero. Five to the one divides A, five to the five divides B. So 5 squared won't divide a, but 5 will, right? So we can see there's a 5 here. And then 7 to the 10 divides a, but not into b. And 11 to the 1 divides b, but not into a. So that's it. We're just simply left with 2 squared times 5 is 4 times 5 is 20. So whatever these numbers are, don't know, the GCD of them is 20. Right? You can think of GCD as a set intersection. Now. If you want to actually compute GCD, you don't want to do this. Taking a number, it turns out that converting a number n into its prime factorization going from n to writing out a list of product of primes is expensive in terms of time, of, in terms of uh, like uh, algorithm runtime. We don't have any efficient way to do this. So although this is how GCD works, this is not the way you want to compute uh, GCD. There is something instead discovered by Euclid called U Euclid's algorithm. Um, Euclid's al algorithm is basically the following. Uh, def GCD, it's a function that returns the GCD of A and B, and it works as follows. Uh, if B is equal to 0, return A. Um, else, return uh, GCD of B and then A mod B. Very simple, very elegant, and in fact, very efficient. This is called the Euclidean algorithm for, for the greatest common divisor. If B is 0, the GCD of A and 0 is A. Would you agree? The greatest common divisor of both A and 0 is going to be a. It's just a in totality. Uh, the greatest common divisor, but if it's not a, it turns out that the GCD of a and b is equal to the GCD of a mod b. That may surprise you, but we're going to prove the correctness of the Euclidean algorithm by proving that's true. We'll prove that the GCD of a comma b is equal to the GCD of a comma a minus b. Okay. That's basically the way the GCD algorithm works, is you take a pair of numbers and you swap them for a smaller pair of numbers. You swap out the bigger number for a smaller number. 
and you repeatedly do that chain. For example, what is the GCD of 25 and 11? If you were to manually compute that, you might say, well, that's 5 squared, 11 is prime, so it's 1. Quickly, you could do that. But we're going to do it using Euclid's algorithm uh, as an example. What you do in Euclid's algorithm is you always take the bigger number and then you get rid of it. So you swap a pair of numbers for a pair of smaller numbers that share one element. By Euclid's algorithm, this is equal to GCD of 11 and what? It's 25 mod 11? Three. So you repeatedly take a problem and you reduce it to a smaller problem using mod. Then you're going to reduce that to a smaller problem and so on. Uh, you take the bigger number and you replace it with a smaller one. What is GCD of 3 comma what? 2. 11 mod 3 is 2, right? GCD of 3 comma 2 is going to be GCD of 2 comma, and you take 3 mod 2 is what? 1. That's equal to uh, the GCD of 2 and then 1, and then you're going to have... The base case is going to go from uh, 2 comma 1 to 0, right? Then once either A or B ch chain all the way down recursively to 0, you return A. So it's just going to be 1, right? We see the execution works. It's a recursive algorithm. You guys have some experience with algorithms that call themselves, right? Of algorithm is recursive intuitively if the function name is also in the code of the function. That's when the function is recursive. Much more rigorous definition than that, but it's intuitively when it's true. We see that we have a recursive algorithm for GCD. Not only is this uh, an elegant algorithm, it's quite beautiful, it's actually quite efficient as well. I think this takes like cubic time. It's, not a, it's very difficult to measure the runtime of this algorithm, but uh, at least for us right, right now, but it's, it, it, I think it's, it's cute. Right? We'll prove the correctness of it in just a second to prove that Euclid's algorithms work. Uh, Euclid's algorithms, the Euclidean algorithm works. But are there any questions on the algorithm itself? If you have to compute GCD, like on pen and paper, and the numbers are too big for you to factor, this is probably the most efficient way. This is the way, what you should be doing. Right. Questions on this? Yes? Is it, should it be like A comma A like mod B? Great question. We're going to prove this is what we want to prove. Right? By the way, convince yourself first that GCD of A comma B is equal to GCD of b comma a. Do you agree with that? Uh, it's symmetric. Second, we're going to prove not that GCD of a b is equal to GCD of a mod b, but something simpler. GCD of a b is equal to GCD of a minus b. Why is that sufficient? Convince yourself for a second. If it was true, if GCD of a b is equal to a GCD of A and A minus B, then this, in fact, is then equal to the GCD of A and A minus B minus B. Right? Which is equal to GCD of A and then A minus KB for some K. So whatever K is largest such that A minus K, KB is still positive, that's just A mod B. Right? When you mod uh, when you mod um, a by b, there is that k. You'll, by modding a by b, you're subtracting b from it some number of times until it's less than b. Right? That's what it is. So it's sufficient for us to simply prove uh, GCD of a, b is equal to GCD of a, a minus b. Convince yourself that we'll prove that simpler statement, and that is going to prove for us that the Euclidean algorithm is correct. Any questions on the setup of the proof before we prove the correctness of the Euclidean algorithm? Okay. How do we prove two numbers are equal? Uh, difficult. Kind of difficult to prove two numbers are equal. Two sets are equal, you do a double set containment. Uh, analogously, you can kind of trick, do a little trick of the light using number theory. We can prove that if, uh, if m divides n and n divides m, what does that imply? m equals n. If two numbers divide each other, each other, it must be the case that they're equal. It's, the only, it's, it's, it's similar to that, right? Similarly, if you have like x is greater than or equal to y and x is less than or equal to y, it must be the case that x equals y, right? There are many analogous ways to prove something like a double set containment. 
uh, the greater than and the less than, and then it must be equal. It turns out it's also true for even division, basic in, 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 Euclidean division. Right? So we'll prove that GCD of A, B divides into GCD of A and A minus B, and then we'll prove GCD of A, A minus B divides into A, B. Right? Questions before we get started on the proof? I want to make sure we have a rigorous found. We understand exactly what's going on. No one's lost. All right. So here's how the proof will work. Um, uh, let a D equal to GCD of A and B. Right. By definition of GCD, we know that D divides into A, uh, and D divides into B. We equivalently know that D is maximal, but here we may not need that. D is the GCD of A and B, so D divides into A, being its divisor, and D divides into B, also being its divisor. So uh, there exists K and L such that uh, uh, DK is equal to A, and uh, DL is equal to B by the definition of divides, right? So A minus B is equal to DK minus DL, which is equal to DK minus L. Since a D is a factor of uh, A minus B, we see that D divides into A minus B. Since uh, D divides into A and D divides into A minus B, that implies that D divides into the GCD of A and A minus B. Right. If some number divides into two numbers, it may be the GCD of those two numbers, but it's only true if it's maximal. At the very least, we may only deduce that it is, divides into the GCD of A and A minus B. Right? Now, D here, again, is just the GCD of A and B. So we've proved one direction. We've proved that the GCD of A and B divides into the GCD of A and A minus B. Questions on this? Do we understand the proof? Make sure we understand the steps. OK, let's do the reverse direction. Uh, let uh, d prime is equal to the GCD of a and a minus b. Uh, so we know that d, divide, d prime divides into a, and d prime divides into a minus b. Right? So uh, there exists a k and l uh, such that uh, D prime K is equal to A, and D prime L is equal to A minus B. What is the next step in the proof? Yes. So uh, d prime k minus d prime l is equal to a minus a minus b. Did I do that right? Yes. And that's going to be equal to a minus a plus b, which is equal to b. So d prime k minus d prime l is equal to b. And then, of course, we can factor this out, so we get d prime k minus l is equal to b, right? Since d prime is a factor of b, d prime divides into b. Since uh, d prime divides into a and d prime divides into b, then d prime divides into the GCD 
of A and B. Since D prime divides into D and D divides into D prime, this implies that D is equal to D prime, which is, again, the GCD of A, B is equal to the GCD of A and A minus B, QED. Questions on that one? Kind of a very straightforward proof. That's most of the proofs in number three are usually really trivial. Like, uh, not to say necessarily easy, and this is a proof that I've had to rewrite like once or twice. Again, when you see me do proof something on the board, you didn't see all the work that went into it. The number of times I had to rewrite it to myself to make sure that the one on the board is clean. Um, but again, it follows simply definition, definition. Very simple proofs, either directly or with uh, contra contradiction. Yes? Would, uh, like, the function, would it be like if, uh, if B is like less than or equal to, like, how do you stop going, like, into negative? Uh, you stop when B is equal to zero. And I claim that when you take the mod, you will never be uh, negative. Right. The, when you mod by N, you're a value between zero and N minus one. Yes. In fact, but you can define the mod of negative numbers and so on. Actually, just by adding, you just add n enough times until you're between 0 and n minus 1. But for simplicity, we just assume mod will return. Our universe of discourse is just zn, 0 to n minus 1. Right. So I don't, in practice, you can do GCD of negative numbers, I'm sure, and, and things like this. But I don't know how it would get negative, right? If a and b, you st if you start positive, you should never get negative. Questions on this proof? Excellent. E e excellent. So I give you GCD, I give you LCM, you guys should be able to calculate it. Uh, let's do um, You guys have heard of GCD, and you guys have heard of, uh, have you guys heard of LCM, the least common multiple? Least common mul multiple, and we'll say LCM, of A and B is equal to some number L, uh, such that some minimal L, uh, such that A divides into L and B divides into L. It's a big tent. It's some number that's small enough that can fit in both A and B as its factors, right? Um, what is, for example, the LCM of 4 and 6? Uh, how would you compute the LCM? One way you can do it is, is the children's way is you, you're looking for the least common multiple. So what you do is, is you can take both numbers and write out multiples of them and find the smallest one. So the common multiples of 4 are 4, uh, 8, 12, 16, something like this. And then the common multiples of 6 are going to be 6, 12, 18, oh, 12. OK. The least common multiple, multiple of both is 12, right? Um, what if, uh, what is the LCM of two prime numbers, P, I, and P, J? You have two numbers. What is the common multiple of PI and PJ? PI times PJ. There shouldn't be any shared pattern between them. PI times PJ, right? What about the LCM of, let's say, like 2 squared and 2 cubed? What is the least common multiple of both? It's some number that's big enough that both of them divide into it. Yeah. It needs to be able to hold 2 cubed, but it also needs to be able to 2 squared. And because 2 squared divides into uh, 2 cubed, we get that it's just a bigger one. Uh, what is the LCM 
of a comma b if a divides into b. Yeah, it's just b. Right. We see the LCM kind of it has a, it's almost a dual structure. Uh, what is the LCM? It while the greatest common divisor is like an, a set intersection. The least common multiple is kind of like a set union. Two and three need to hold three twos and two twos, but you can do that just by holding three twos, right? So if I were to write out analogously a prime factorization of A and B as the LCM of the product of PI is equal to 1 to K of PI to the AI and the product of I, is, of, let's say J is equal to 1 to the L of PJ to the BJ, what is that equal to in terms of PI, AI, and BI? Well, it's going to be a prime factorization. Everything has a unique prime factorization. AI, I equals 1 of what to the what? PI, let's suppose PI is PI. I think you're close, but not exact. What is the largest, if, if something is a factor of 2, for example, let's do um, LCM of 2 squared times A and LCM of 2 cubed times B, we're going to get 2 to what times something. What is, the, what is the power of 2 of the LCM of both? For 2 squared and 2 cubed? 3, yeah. 3 is going to be the largest power of 2. Now, the rest of the things are important, but you need to have 3 powers of 2. Why? Because this has to divide into it. So if it's just the largest power of 2, it has this 4, is 2, it's not going to work. right? Given that, what should the product be? Right. It's going to be pi to the, the max of ai bi. And to what power? What is the summation? What does the product stop at? Max kl. Yeah. Quick example. What is the LCM of 2 squared, 2 cubed times 3, and 3, and let's say 5 squared? Let's say 5 to the 10. What is that? Yeah. You need to fit both numbers in there. So 2 cubed times 3 times 5 to the 10. Now, a lot of times, a multiple of both a, a common multiple of a and b is going to be a, b, right? But it's not always a times b, because sometimes a and b share some factors. You want the least common multiple. Here, you don't need 2 cubed 3 times 3 times 5 to the 10, because 3 is already in each one once. So the least common multiple says you don't need 3 squared here. You just need 3. That's the way to think about the least common multiple, right? So we see that the LCM can be re represented almost like a union. It's a max of AI, BI, right, of the powers. Questions on the definition of the LCM so far? OK. Um, what is the GCD? If the GCD of A and B is equal to 1, what do you know uh, that implies the LCM of A and B is equal to what? AB. AB. Why? Because they have no common factors. So it's like you to come have the two numbers together, you need to take their product. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically. Let's generalize this idea. If, if the GCD of A and B is 1, that means what we, they, what we would call relatively prime. They share no factors other than 1. So basically, they're at, analogous to set theory. They're like disjoint. They're like nothing is in common except 1. So if nothing's in common, the only multiple that can contain both A and B has to be big. It's the biggest one. It's just AB. Right? Um, we'll prove. Uh, we gave a Euclidean algorithm for computing uh, GCD. It was efficient. 
Here, again, we have another formulation of how to compute LCM, but it's complicated because you've got to do the prime factorization. And prime factorization is really expensive. It's, a computer usually can't do prime factorization. It's too big. So it, it takes too long. So we need a nice algorithm. Is there a nice algorithm to compute LCM? Like we have a very nice, beautiful algorithm to compute GCD. Turns out, yes and no. We don't have a nice, beautiful algorithm to compute LCM directly. But it turns out that there is a relationship between the GCD and LCM. We will prove that the GCD of AB times the LCM of AB is equal to, does anyone know? Product of the two numbers. AB. That should match your intuition here. If GCD of AB is 1, then LCM of AB has to be AB, right? This gives us a way to compute LCM. This is a theorem we'll prove. That's what we'll spend today on. But to compute the LCM, uh, you can just do LCM of AB is equal to AB over the GCD of AB. Now, that's not a fraction. It turns out that's still a number. Why? Because LC, first off, the left-hand side is not a fraction. So this being a number means this is a number. Once we prove this theorem, that will imply that GCD of AB must divide into AB, right? But certainly you knew that. Uh, from the definition of GCD. So we know that GCD of AB divides into AB as well. But we'll prove this theorem that the product of the GCD and the LCM is equal to AB. This gives us an efficient way to compute the LCM without having to compute the prime factorization, without having to compute two really long lists of numbers. What you do, compute GCD nicely and recursively using Euclid's algorithm. Compute AB. Take AB divided by GCD of A and B. Right. Questions on this statement so far? Questions on LCM in general? Questions on GCD in general? Speak up now if you hold your peace, right? We're going to prove the theorem uh, that the GCD of uh, AB and LCM of AB is equal to AB, right? Now, this is an interesting problem because there are like, I don't know, eight proofs of this I found online. And I had to go through each one to see which one was the, like the nicest proof. So we're going to just do the nicest proof of this instead of doing the hardest proofs of this. You guys hopefully will do the same when you turn in homework. Uh, first, we need a lemma. Uh, max of AB plus min of AB is equal to what? A plus B. Why? One has to be greater. One has to be the max, and one has to be the min. Yeah. This doesn't work for three max of ABC, by the way, but it only works for max of AB. Uh, max of AB is going to be, suppose A is greater than B. Max of AB is A, so min of AB is B, so that's A plus B. Without loss of generality, slap that on there, you get A plus B. If A equals B, then the max of AB is A, and the min of AB is a, B is A also. So it's like A plus B is equal to A plus A. So same thing. Uh, kind of obvious number, but we'll use that in our proof. All right. Uh, how we'll proceed, uh, let uh, A, B, B numbers. Uh, with uh, prime factorizations. Um, uh, A is equal to the product of I equals 1 to K of PI to the AI, and B is equal to the product of J is equal to 1 to L of PJ to the BJ, right? Then, We'll simply write the GCD of A comma B times the LCM of A comma B, and we'll proceed by a direct calculation. What is the GCD of A comma B again? Uh, the GCD of A comma A minus B. Um, that is useful to us, but it doesn't advance the proof. Uh, pi of i 
to I to min KL PI over min A, AI BI. Okay. Is that legible? Can you guys read that? LCM, equivalently, is the product of I is equal to 1 of max of KL of PI to the max of AI BI. Right? We have a product of a bunch of numbers times a product of a bunch of numbers. We can reorganize this, right? We get, let's put everything on the same thing. We'll get a product of i is equal to, let's say, the max of k comma l of pi to the min of ai bi times pi to the max of ai comma bi. Do you agree with that? It's a multiplication of multiplications. Multiplication is commutative. We may simply swap things around. Right? There's a power of 2 here. There's a power of 2 here. Let's just make sure that we put the two powers of 2 next to each other in the product. Right? Questions on this step? Do we believe me on this step? Yes? Where's the KF? Of here? Yeah, there is a Ah, so there is um, two sequences of different lengths. One is length k and one is length l. But we need to take the product in a nice way. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the bigger one, which is max, and then we'll just define the, the next several a's to be 0. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like a l plus, a k plus 1 is 0, a k plus 2 is 0, and so on, right? It ends up working out. OK, rules of arithmetic, what do we do here? Some of the exponents. Yeah. Pi i equals 1 to max of k comma l is equal to pi to the max of ai uh, bi plus min of ai bi. Right? Now, we apply our lemma, and what are we going to get? I to the AI plus BI. We're going to get the max, the, the product of PI to the AI plus BI from I equals 1 to max of KL, right? Now, by rules of arithmetic, what are we going to do? You should be able to finish the proof from here, right? Uh, we separate. Okay. We re split this into two products. All right. What is PI to the AI, the product of PI to the AI? A. What is product of pi to the bi? D. So this is just equal to what? A D. Proof by direct calculation. Many great proofs of this problem. I think this one's my favorite. It uses a cute little lemma. Question? Yes. Uh, with the max to like the KL, you say that if it's not, if you go beyond, you just plug in a zero. Yeah, suppose like if let's say the AIs were like 2, 3, 5, and then the BIs were like, uh, I don't know, 7, 2, 10, 11. All you're going to do is just increase the smaller sequence with a bunch of zeros. Ends up working out because PI to the zero is 1. 
So I could have begun the proof perhaps cleaner. I, I said, let uh, k be the max of k and l. And then if one sequence is longer than another, suppose it has some redundant amount of zeros at the end. Right? That, that would have made the ship shape proof at the end a little better. In fact, this is a great comment on proof writing. I would have worked this proof out on paper. Had I done a better job, I would have noticed this little detail. And I would have written the proof, so you would have never even had to ask this question. I would have restarted the proof. Here, changing instead of k and l as two numbers, I would have said this sequence padding thing at the beginning. Right? Then the question would not have had to be asked. Example of how to write a better proof, right? Questions on this proof? All right, that's all I have for you. We'll see you guys on Tuesday. Excuse me, Thursday. <laughs>